I just want to take a few minutes and open up the Word of God to you, and then we're going to get ready to pray with, with people that are here today and online. It was A.W. Tozer, the great Christian writer, who said these words. He says, 10,000 thoughts a day pass through our minds trying to predict what we will become. 10,000 thoughts trying to tell you what you are and what you're going to do. That's why it's so important when you realize what Proverbs 23, 7 says, that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And today, just over these next few moments, I want us to believe as we bring the movie, the music, the testimonies together, I want to believe that those predictions in your mind are going to stop today. Because many of those thoughts are going to try to paralyze. They're going to try to predict. And I, I want to give you a piece of advice today. Get, get ready now. Here it is. Don't believe everything you think. It was Anne Lamont, the Christian writer, who said this. She said, my mind is a bad neighborhood that I try not to go into it alone. You know, the Apostle Paul begins to kind of elaborate on that bad neighborhood and, and talk about what goes on in that thought process. Listen to what he says in the book of Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, the weapons we use in our fight are not the world's weapons, but God's powerful weapons, which we use to destroy. Here's one of the members of that bad neighborhood. We use to destroy strongholds. Another member in that bad neighborhood is we try to destroy false arguments. And he goes on to say, we pull down every proud obstacle that raises up against the knowledge of God and we take thought, we take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. That's part of that neighborhood that Paul is talking about in, that seems to come and, 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 and attack with those 10,000 things constantly. It was Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, who said it like this, I'm not a man, I am a civil war talking about the rage that goes on inside of his mind. That's why Jesus brings it all together. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 22. Jesus said this. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your what? Mind. Wow. Jesus even addresses that and says that part of bringing the full man together is it's not just the heart and soul, but it is also the mind. And we thought we just needed to educate the mind. What we really needed was the healing of the mind so that we can love God fully and the way that we're supposed to. That's what today is all about. It's getting the mind healed and healthy so we can love God just like Jesus said. And we have to understand when we go through those battles that we're not less of a Christian when we go through those. In fact, others go through it. The Apostle Paul continues on in Corinthians and tells us this in 1 Corinthians 10. Listen to what he says. He says, there's no test or temptation that comes your way that is beyond the course of what others had to face. You're not alone. And then he gives this encouragement. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit and he's always, he'll always be there to help you come through it. Hallelujah. You know, that, that's, I experienced that. Thinking that at first I was alone and not knowing what, why I was facing certain thoughts. I remember after I got married and Cindy and I had our first child that one of those 10,000 thoughts that got through one day and literally brought fear to my heart was, and this was after flying tens of thousands of miles with the airlines, I started to get this fear that hit me, that after our first child was born, our second child, that this incredible fear, these thoughts came to me and said, if you get on that plane, that plane is going down, you're never going to see your kids get married, and you're going to watch your wife from heaven marry another man. 
And I'm thinking to myself, this is ridiculous. Where, where is it? And then I'm telling you, every time I had to get on a plane, I held on to that seat, thought that this thing is going. I said the ABCs to myself every single time that plane was going up in the air, knowing that it, eventually it was coming down. I, I couldn't believe. How, how do you go? How does it go from head to foot? How does it go from thinking it and then all of a sudden acting it out and then embarrassed about it? How do you have these kind of thoughts as a pastor? How are you afraid to get on a plane just to, just to go minister or to go on vacation with your family? And, and you feel like you're the only one that's going through this until one day it brought such hope to me. And who would have thought that the person I knew with the most faith the most fearless person I know when it came to the Christian walk wouldn't fly on a plane for decades. And it was the founder of this church, David Wilkerson. And, and, and I remember talking to Brother Dave about it. This is the man that stood before Nicky Cruz and the Mau Mau gangs of Brooklyn. And when Nicky looked at him and says, you better stop preaching, I'm going to cut you up into a thousand pieces. And, and that little skinny preacher from Pennsylvania looked at Nicky Cruz and said, you can cut me up in a thousand pieces and every piece will say I love you. And I'm looking at that, but yet, why were you afraid of United, American, and Delta? And I'll never forget what Brother Dave told me. He said this to me. It was the greatest advice. He said, the reason why I don't get on a plane is because of Jesus. And I said, what? He said, Jesus said this, and lo, I am with you even unto the end of the earth. Lo, I am with you. Not 30,000 feet up, but right on the ground is when I am with you. It was the great Christian writer, C.S. Lewis. This is where... I began to understand what Brother Dave was talking about. C.S. Lewis said, this is where friendships are born. He said, friendship is born at the moment when one man says to another, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. How many have ever felt that before? You kind of realize, I'm not in this all by myself. And you aren't alone in this fight. What we're talking about today is really the fight that when one of those 10,000 thoughts that are not from God, breaks through and tries to move you from head to foot. And that's where I began to realize that it happens to me, it happens to a David Wilkerson, and it even happened to one of the godly men in the Bible that was called a man after God's own heart. It happened to David in the Bible. His story tells us about the battle, but it also talks about the victory. And let me just share for just a second here how a godly man can give in to ungodly thoughts. David is coming to the, to the finish line, not of his life, but really of the pinnacle of what God has called him to. He's coming to the finish line of why God has his hand upon David. It really, he received a prophecy at 16 years old, and according to the Bible, he's just a few chapters away from putting a crown on his head and the, the shepherd boy was gonna become a king in just a few chapters. And isn't it amazing that the closer you get to what God wants you to be, that the more intense the battles become. And that's where David was at. He has experienced God rescuing his life from death-defying experiences, from people that are trying to kill him, and God has been rescuing his life. And then something goes wrong. Something, one of those rogue thoughts, those 10,000 thoughts seem to get lodged into David's head. But David couldn't fight through it. And all of a sudden, it was moving from head to foot. And what I mean by that is it was removing from just thinking about it to now, here it comes, acting it out. Listen to it. This is what happens. Right after a miracle of God saving David's life, this is what he says in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1. He says, then David said to who? Himself. That's the rogue thought. Now he is listening to himself and he says, now I'm going to perish one day. That's his plane talk, his Delta Airlines talk. Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul and there's nothing better for me to do than to escape into the hand of the Philistines. Saul then will despair of searching for me any more in all the territory of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. David was basically saying this, I'm tired of fighting these thoughts. I'm tired of dealing with this every single day. It's too much for me. 
And the Bible says in the very next verse, it goes from head to foot. Watch what he does. He doesn't just think it. Now he's acting it out. So David arose and crossed over he and 600 men who were with him and lives those feet take him to a land and he starts to live there. The Bible says the number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. See, the mind is always fighting every single day. We know it. All of us know it. But the heat of the battle is when the thought tries to go from head to foot, when what you're thinking now goes into behavior. It was as if one of my friends said it like this. He said, you're only as sick as your secrets. And that's what sometimes happens and what we go through. David keeps silent about something which he should have confessed, like Dr. Evelyn was talking about. But the silence of David just doesn't take his two feet over. Think about this for a moment. It takes 1,200 feet over. And in fact, not just 1,200 of 600 men, it takes their wives and their children. We don't know exactly, but we know that there were families that went over with this man, with, with David, when he went over into this, into this land. But this land, almost, I have to explain this to you, what this land meant. He goes over to Gath, G-A-T-H. Here's a question for you, Times Square Church. What was the name of the giant that David killed with a stone? Goliath. But here's what's interesting. His full name was Goliath of Gath. That the giant killer, David, is now the defeated man living in Goliath country. That all of a sudden he is brought over for a year and four months to live in a land that God had no intention for him to live in. That's what those thoughts can do. That's what those road thoughts can begin to do to us. It can take us into a place and it goes from head to foot, from thinking to behaving is what begins to happen. When we were, when I was living in Detroit, I, I bought a home in a very difficult area, a very, a, a very dangerous area of town where we were planting a church I was still a single man and I bought a home and my nephew came and lived with me and we were living in this area. Um, and this was not an expensive home. My car in the driveway cost more than this home. Um, it, was, um, it was an old home, almost, almost 100 years old this home was. And there is a thing, many of you online may not know what this is. Some of you are not from New York, may not know what this is. But the way these old homes used to heat their heat, get heated, there was this giant thing in each room, these cast iron registers. We call them ra radiators. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, you can't lift though. The, they're cast iron. If you did, then we have to do a healing service here for you. They're, they're mammoth. Well, I didn't know about this. I'm a new homeowner, and I remember moving in in this neighborhood, buying this home. And when we moved in, I remember one of the first nights I was there. It was a cold night. I turned up the heat on this old furnace. Our furnace in the basement, I'm telling you, was so big. It looked like the one from Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. It was gigantic. And that was the thing that ran these, these heat radiators. And here's what happened, is that one night, one of the very first nights, I hear this banging going on. And I'm going, if they're not going to get me on a plane, they're going to kill me in this home. They're trying to get in and kill me. And what nobody told me was, is that when air gets in the radiator, it bangs. I thought they're coming, there's like an army coming through the windows, coming through the front door. And folks, I sat there on the top steps with a bat, waiting for someone to show up, going, listen, if I'm going down, I'm going down with a fight, is what I thought. Until someone told me about the, the air in the radiators, and the, I lost the night of sleep because of rogue thoughts that had this idea that they're all breaking in. David's rogue thoughts lost him a year and a half, and some of you are sitting here today, and it has been more than a year and a half. For some of you, it's been two, three, four, five years that you've lost it because something got, went from head to foot. It went from thinking it to, to acting it out. 
That rogue, rogue thought comes in, but here's how David's story ends as the band gets ready to come and we get ready to close. How does David's story end? A wake-up call comes, maybe even like what's happening here today. He begins to see and realize it has not only affected him, but has it affected his family and his children and all of his men's children. In fact, an enemy, raiders came in while David was on a mission and took all of their children and wives away. And now David realized that my bad decision, me acting out that crazy thought that was trying to predict my future, one of those 10,000 thoughts has now begun to affect my wife and my children. And something's got to change here. In fact, his children and his wives of all the men were POWs and they were brought away as captives. And the men were so upset. David was so distressed that they even wanted to kill David. Listen to this and listen to what happens to David, his wake-up call. David was greatly distressed because the men, his men, were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because their sons and daughters, they're all gone. And here it comes. But David found strength in the Lord his God. In this moment, strength comes. This is the beginning of David's journey back. It was the, it was the dark tunnel, the dark moment that Nadia was talking about. I, I just kept thinking about what the, the, great, the great Christian woman, Corey Temboon, who was in a concentration camp during the Holocaust, and this is what she said during one of her dark times. Listen to these words. Don't miss this. She said, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. Folks, that's what we're called to. That's what Nadia did. That's what Dr. Evelyn was encouraging us. That's eventually what Pastor Jesse and Eli began to do. And this is what David did. David talked to the engineer in his dark tunnel. And this is what he said to God. He said, then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders, the ones that took all of our family, our sons and our daughters and our wives, will I catch them? And I, I just love these next five words. And the Lord told him. David's no longer listening to himself. He's listening to God. He's listening what the Lord would tell him. And here's what God says. Don't you love this? Go after them. You're going to recover everything that was taken from you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's exactly how the story ended. David chose to listen to God. And this is the way the story ended. Listen to fi finally this verse. Nothing was missing. Here it comes. Small or great, son or daughter, nor anything else that had been taken. And David brought everything back. Praise God. Praise God. I want to believe this is a day we're getting those things back today. Time lost. The things that have been taken from us. Time that has been wasted. Energy that has been spent. And fears that have been gripped hold of. And this is how we end today. You know, there are two weapons to help us in this fight. It's Christ and the body of Christ. Christ and the body of Christ. This is so imperative and important. Stand with me as I just read this last verse to you and as we get ready to pray. You know this verse. It's, it's probably one of the most misquoted verses in all of the New Testament. I'm going to explain to you why this verse is so key for us to understand because our healing is involved with this verse. Listen to this verse. This is what it says. The effectual fervent prayers of what? A righteous man. What do they do? Well, the problem is that's the second half of the verse. If we don't get the first part, we don't know what he's trying to say to us in the second part. Listen to the whole verse. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. Why? That ye may be healed. And who's supposed to pray for us? The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. Folks, this is powerful. That means when I'm going through it, here it is, when I'm going through it, I don't need someone to know me. I need someone that knows God.
Here's what I've learned. Listen, balcony. Listen, main floor. Listen, online. That probably the person that's going to help bring healing to you is not probably on your phone list. Don't call them. You call them. Yeah, bro, you are messed up. I don't need all that. I don't need someone to know me. I don't need someone to go, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, bro. I don't, I don't need all of that. I need to know, can you get a hold of God? Can you talk to God and God answer you? That's why tonight as we pray, you may be sitting there and one of those 10,000 thoughts are going, those people don't know you. They don't have to know you. They have to know God. And if they know God, let them pray over you today and let's believe for healing and that God gives everything back today. That God works the miracle out. Oh, I want to believe for it today. In just a few moments, we're gonna, in fact, I'm going to ask our prayer teams to come up. They're coming up. These are men and women, leaders in the church, elders, pastors, directors. These folks are amazing people that know God and they're going to call heaven. And so what we're going to ask you to do in just a few moments, they're going to be lined up here. They're going to be lined up in front of me. And so what we're going to ask you to do when we close, as, as well, not really close, but kind of as this ministry moment, I'm going to ask if you want to be prayed for. You're saying, Pastor Tim, some of those rogue thoughts have gotten in. They're trying to go, some of them actually have gone from my head to my feet. That What does that mean? It means that what I've been thinking, I've been acting out. And I need, I need healing. I need God to come and bring healing. God to come and work a miracle in me. Here's what we're going to ask you to do today. In these last minutes that we have together, if you want to be prayed for, those in, in the balcony, main floor, I'm going to ask you to start lining up on either wall down over here. Now, there's a reason why we're doing that. Now, as soon as I'm saying this, the thoughts are coming. Ooh, they're going to know you got problems. Okay, look at, look at me. Look at me for a second. Okay, we all got problems. Who cares what they think? And if you're worried about if they think you got problems, we already know. Listen, all of us up here, this, this, how many, I've told, I've said this before. If I wasn't speaking, I'd be along the wall today. How many are with me? How many would be, look, look how messed up we are up here on this stage. We need God. We all need God. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. As I'm speaking now, you can start coming and just lining up on these walls and then we're going to start praying. The reason why we're doing that is because we want to keep the middle aisles clear to send you out. Now while we get ready to pray, you can start coming now. While we get ready to pray, we're going to take these next 10-15 minutes. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to stay, to stay in worship. Even like that song that Leah was leading us in when, when, she, when she was singing that part that, that almost declaring and all I did was worship. All I did was stay still. All I did was lift my hands. I'm going to ask you to do that today. As we sing, as people are lining up of this place, and we're going to all be getting prayed for today, would you sing over them songs of deliverance today and join with them as people are coming down and people are getting ready to be prayed for? But I have to do one last thing before we pray. Here it comes. Listen to this. I remember... A pastor named John Ortberg who said this, he says, peace doesn't come from finding a lake with no storms. It comes from having Jesus in the boat. Some of you are trying to get peace by finding some, some form of life that I have no problems. Here, newsflash, doesn't exist. But what does exist is Jesus with me every single time. You can't, you can't find a place. Some of you are going like, that's why I'm trying to move to Montana or Idaho. I'm going to try to get up there, but I don't want to be in the Bronx. And so you're trying to figure out if there's a place. That's why, what do you, what do you think all of these rich people are going to Montana? Why do you want to hide them? Because they don't think, and folks, let me just tell you, there are demons in Montana and there are demons in Idaho and there are demons in Manhattan. How many know all that to be true? You can't, the issue is not looking for a place without storms. It's finding Jesus to go with you. That's what he wants. You can't do it. This is what Isaiah says. Isaiah says he'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Because he trusts in you. 
You cannot do life without Jesus. Storms will be wherever you go. Get on a plane, there'll be a storm. Go to Idaho, go to the Bronx, go to Staten. Wherever you go, there is going to be storms. You have to get Jesus in your life. Just bow your head for a moment. Close your eyes for a moment. If you're here in this place, watching online, it's the most important thing before we start to pray for you. If you've never trusted your heart to Christ, See, I'm not talking about being in church. I'm talking about asking Christ to come in and change you from the inside out. And some of you are sitting here and watching online. Some of you are watching right now from the UK. You're watching from Singapore. You're watching from Japan. You're watching from Trinidad. And you're watching from around the world in Paraguay and Uruguay, Nigeria and Ethiopia. And you're trying to find a storm-free life. And it's impossible. I found, I know a Jesus that can let me live in perfect peace even though the storm is around me. Because with him inside of me, if God be for us, who can be against us? And maybe you've never trusted your heart to Jesus before. It says he'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he has trusted in him. To trust in him means to be born again. It means God comes in and changes us. Religion says come to church for two hours and just try to try to get rid of your problem And that's religion relationship says when you walk outside these doors It may be it may be hard to what you're going back to but God goes Relationship says I go with you and if you're here today and say pastor Tim I want God in my life. I just don't not only want prayer I not only do I want the body of Christ, but I want Christ in my life. That's the first part and if you want that, I'm going to pray a prayer just before we start to pray individually. If you're here today and just say, Pastor Tim, I want God in my life. I want, to, I want Jesus to come in and change me from the inside out. Wherever you are, online or in this place, and say, would you, would you pray for me that God would change me, that I would be born again today? I'm going to pray a prayer that just to ask God to come into my life and to change me. If that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, and say, Pastor Tim, put me in that prayer when you pray that. I want God in my life. Hold your hand up now. Quickly, hold it up as high as you can. Look at all these. Keep them up high. Oh my goodness. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. Keep them up. I want to make sure I see every 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Thank God. You can put your hands down. Thank God. Hey, can we pray this together? Come on, all of us. Say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my guide. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. Hallelujah.